Hello and welcome to another Piper Pearl. Today's pearl we're going to be looking at Ot Alga. So we'll move right along with a bit of etiology and epidemiology. So when we talk about Ot Alga, it's classified into primary and secondary causes. Now primary causes luckily are the most common. They take up 85% of all cases. Now we'll discuss a little bit further how Different studies can skew those numbers a bit, but overall, 85% of cases of ear pain will be of a primary cause. And secondary will obviously be the 15%. And when we break down the primary causes of ear pain, the most common one, especially in children, is acute otitis media. And the most common version of secondary causes is caused by proximal regions. Now that is broken down by a referred pain from the head, neck and, and jawline and also dental pain is a very, very common cause of your secondary cases themselves. Now interestingly enough, uh, when you break down between the sexes of adults, you'll find that men are more likely to have primary ear pain while women are more likely to have secondary ear pain, so pain caused by secondary causes. Now, when you're dealing with paediatrics, it's pretty much primary the whole time. When you go further uh, and you have studies that basically focused on certain demographics like women, they will show that over 50% of the pain caused in the ear is actually by secondary means. When we look at simple classifications of what causes our primary pain, primary pains are caused by your infectious, your mechanical problems, cancers within the regions, and inflammatory problems. Whereas secondary, there's a huge list that we'll go into in a lot more detail to come, but it's usually classified based on the organ system that the referred pain is coming from. So speaking of which, we'll have a look at the anatomy of your secondary ear pain. So the ear itself is actually made up of a very, very complex neural network that intervenes all around the ear itself and it results from embryonic development. So when you're developing your ear is actually within, mixed in with a lot of your other organs, uh, which means it has this neural connection. So the ear itself shares a neural network with other organs and that there can lead to numerous potential causes of referred pain. Now, if you were to look at the differential diagnosis, especially of secondary ear pain, the list is enormous. Things that you probably wouldn't even think about. Now, in particular, we have cranial nerve 5, the trigeminal, cranial nerve 7, the facial, 9, glossopharyngeal, and 10, vagus of the cranial nerves. And we also have neural networks from the cervical plexus of C2 and C3 that will also innovate with the ear itself. So when we look at our cranial nerve 5, the trigeminal, we obviously know that's broken up into three branches itself. So you've got your ophthalmic, your maxillary, and mandible. So when you're having referred pain to the ear, it can actually be a problem with the face, the sinus, the palate, the teeth itself, and even the temporal mandibular joint, which is quite a common secondary site. If you have a closer look at the facial nerve, this is can be referred pain from the two-thirds of the tongue and the sublingual and the submandibular salivary glands as well. So salivary gland inflammation or infection can actually cause refer ear pain. This is very similar to cranial nerve 9, your glossopharyngeal, where you get referred pain from the other part of the tongue and the oropharynx itself. Cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve, that can be referred from the sinuses, the thyroid gland, uh, the pharynx and the larynx, but it can also be referred pain from disorders or pathophysiological states from the heart, the lungs, and certain components of the gastrointestinal tract. So as you can imagine, this ear pain potentials just keep spreading. When we look closer at the back of the neck, at your C2 and C3 region, then if you have a problem with your head, back of your neck, your sternal caudal mastoid itself, then you can get referred pain to the ear itself. So as you could imagine, when you're working on your clinical workup, even though you're most likely to get a primary cause, 
if the primary cause isn't making sense of your ear infections or something wrong with the canal, then you actually need to go into a much deeper investigation in order to help further investigations into what the secondary cause is itself. So moving right along, we'll start with our subjective investigations and we'll look at the event. Now the main thing we need to get from the event is you need to try to pinpoint down if it's a primary cause or if it's a secondary cause. And that is best done by looking at your accompanying symptoms. So the most common accompanying symptom for primary causes is actually your upper respiratory tract infections. So you'll get your sinusitis, your pharyngitis, your rhinitis, and all those things cause inflammation around the eustachian tubes, which spreads to the ear, and you end up with an ear infection. So that's the most common primary cause itself. Now, when it can get quite bad and a red flag for ear pain is when a person has difficulty or pain on swallowing, they also have difficulty speaking, and obviously any blood that they're coughing up as well. There's some quite common big red flags. Now, from there, we can also look for sinus pain, so chronic rhinosinovitis. We can look for toothaches, dental problems, headaches, that sort of thing. They can all give us secondary reasons. Heartburn can be indicative of a GIT problem. Shortness of breath can obviously denote the lungs. Upper back pain can look at your C2 and 3 problems from there. But then you can also have accompanying hearing loss as well. And if the patient does have any hearing loss, then you need to go down a line or specific objective investigations that we'll move on to. So all this information needs to be sussed out, okay? And it can be done just by asking the patient, got ear pain, what are your other symptoms that you have? With that, you can look at past history. Obviously, long, detailed history of ear problems, particularly with children. You can have certain children that will go through a series of grommets before uh, they actually are relieved, where their adenoids get removed. All sorts of things can happen. We want to know about recent illnesses as well for any contributing factors for the overall infectious state in particular. And we want to know chronic illnesses as well because there's certain risk factors that can make it worse, okay? Especially when you're dealing with immunosuppressive state like diabetes myelitis can make things work. From there, we can do a little bit of social questioning, look at their history, and we can ask what they've been doing. Whether they've been flying on aeroplanes, whether they've been swimming in water, whether they've been diving, anything that increases the barra pressures within the ears can obviously lead to a problem. And swimming, or being in the tropics, can obviously lead us to suspecting that it may be acute otitis externa, which we can discuss later on. So when we move into our subjective questioning, then we really need to do a pain profile. Because the complaint is pain in the ear, we need to do a pain profile. So if swimming and swallowing makes it worse, that can be good telltale signs. Swallowing making it worse, remember, is a red flag, and you should refer them from there. Swimming, more likely, is going to be otitis externa. When we ask about the quality of pain, they can have different things that can link us to differential diagnosis. So if the person explains that they're actually feeling more of a fullness rather than an ear pain, it may be associated with a condition which is called cholesterotomus. Now, cholesterotomus is quite a rare, luckily, disorder, but it's actually caused by an increase in your keratinized squamal cells within your ear, and will actually involve the middle ear and the mastoid. So this cellular mass will just keep increasing within the ear and will actually clog it up and you'll end up getting conductive hearing loss, full feeling within your ear itself. So just keep that one in line. Whilst it won't be presenting with ear pain, it's just one that sort of overlaps. That's quite an important one to look out for. But when you're dealing with your sharp pain or you say it's laceration pain, then you're mostly dealing with your neurological based pains itself. In an ache, can actually be quite indicative of that pressure feeling from the tightest media or referred pain from a toothache as well. Any radiation, we're really dealing with the proximal sites, okay, because people won't know that they're 
GIT problem is causing the ear pain. Okay, but when the site comes from something that is close, so neck, jawline, TMJ, that sort of thing, then they can usually denote that I've actually got pain the side of my jaw, under my chin, okay, and that can give us some indications of what's going on. Severity is purely asked to find out how debilitating the pain is to help us in our management later on. But duration can tell us a lot. So when we're dealing with shorter time frames, they're usually short, intense pain, and they're more benign, mostly primary causes. If you're dealing with a longer time frame, so someone's had a lo lower level, but longer duration of this earache, then it's more suggestive to be of secondary causes. Now, any ear pain lasting over four weeks is more suspicious to be your malignancies. Okay, it's not a guarantee, but it's obviously more suspicious to be your malignancies itself. You need to ask about discharge, and then obviously have a subsequent look for discharge as well. Now, discharge can easily be said by they finding anything on their pillow when they wake up after lying on it, that sort of thing. There is a discharge, then obviously we add that to the differentials. We move on to allergies and meds. That's basically there to help us find out what sort of medications we can give. There's not a lot of correlation with allergies or medications apart from its link to the upper respiratory and sinus problems itself. After our subjective investigations, we obviously move on to our objective findings. And this is where we break things up. So if we're feeling that based on our data, it's more likely to be primary cause, then a lot of the times when you do your objective investigation, you'll stop at looking at the ear, maybe looking at the oral cavity, that sort of thing, but not too much further from there. So we always start in the ear because that's where the complaint was. So we look in the good ear, if they have one bad ear, just for comfort, so we can tell the difference, and we're looking for signs of infection. We conduct something known as a pineal pull, which is basically where you grab the top part of the ear, which you will anyway to have a look in with an otoscope, and you pull it. You just give it a tug. If that causes pain, it's more likely to be uh, your bacterial otitis externa. We have a look in with an otoscope and we have a good look at the ear canal and the tympanic membrane. Now I'm going to do a subsequent lesson on the use of an otoscope, so I won't go into too much detail now. You obviously do a full set of vital signs and you look for signs of a fever. Most cases of good otitis media will come with a fever. So if it's an infectious otitis media, you will have a fever. Now if you find a cause, whether it's tympanic membrane rupturing, otitis externa, otitis media, maybe even otitis media effusion, whatever it is, then there's really no need to go on with further investigations into the secondary space from there. Okay, so you can save yourself some time. But if it's not quite adding up, and you can't find, quite find the cause, then you move on to our further objective investigations, which means a complete examination of the nasal cavity, the oral cavity, the TMJ. That's technically a good idea to do anyway, just to see if there's any involvement in that temporal mandibular joint with otitis media. You do an examination of the head and neck, which includes the head and cervical glands itself, and you palpate the cervical spine. If you still don't have any idea what's going on, it can be advisable to do your full cranial nerve assessment, because as alluded to, you have four cranial nerves that have direct links with ear pain itself. So you're better off doing the full set, getting a good understanding of what's going on, so then you can add that to your handover. If the patient complains of any hearing loss, then you can test it. You can test it poorly with a whisper or a hair rub test, or you can conduct something in the field known as a Weber and Rainer's test, which will be included in the other lesson. And if you're back in a facility that can do so, then you can do an audiometry as well to get the real data. If during the examination you notice that there's any discharge at all, it is best to swab that discharge and get it tested for bacteria. That way, if you do put them on antibiotics, they're more likely to get a sensitivity screening come back, an MCS, that you can actually pinpoint the best antibiotic for the patient. Okay, once we have all of our data, 
then we can move on to our assessment. And the big part of our assessment is to decide whether it's primary or it's secondary. A lot of the time primary, we can do something about it, or at least we can start the fixing of the problem. If it's secondary, then most of the time it needs a lot more investigation. So if it's a primary cause and the problem is ceramol impaction, so we're dealing with wax, then you can go through the process of removing the wax if you, if you can. But ceramol impaction is actually quite common to cause ear pain itself. So it's a buildup of the wax that causes symptoms such as your hearing loss, your fullness, your itchy, your pain, can even get tinnitus, stuff like that. Now, in the presence of any other symptoms, it can be a good idea to remove the wax itself. Okay, but the diagnosis of ceramol impaction can be made purely by looking at it with the otoscope. Now, you can remove the impaction if you know how to do it, and we'll talk about some techniques with that when we're dealing with the treatment side of the house. But if for some reason you cannot see the TM, you can't really make a diagnosis of any of the of otitis media or anything else like a rupture without actually looking at it. So that can become part of the reason that they need their wax removed. Now, otitis externa is defined as an infection or inflammation of the ear canal itself. 10% of people will likely get it within their life. 90% uh, of all the cases will actually be unilateral as opposed to bilateral. A okay, majority of cases are in adults, and there's a strong association with high humidity, high temperatures, swimming, local trauma like earbuds, that sort of thing, uh, and also people with diabetes myelitis. The hallmark symptoms, obviously, is your ear pain and obviously a positive pineal pull as well. Now, when we move on to otitis media, otitis media caused by an infection is just called that, acute otitis media. And it's defined as an infection of fluid accumulating in the middle ear. It's the most common thing to go wrong with babies between the age of 6 and 24 months. And then it basically decreases with age as it goes on, as we've already discussed. The most reliable symptoms you will find for otitis media is the presence of ear pain and up to two-thirds of the patient will have a fever. Okay, so ear pain and fever and obviously your positive signs when you look in at the actual tympanic membrane itself. Now there can be a special type of otitis media that doesn't actually involve an infection or an inflammatory state and that is known as otitis media with effusion. So that's defined as an accumulation of fluid in the middle ear space without obviously any other signs itself. Now it's a common pediatric presentation and it can be 20% of the time when you're dealing with children. So often misdiagnosed as those titus media, uh, but it's actually different etiology. So you get a combination of clinical signs and your otoscope can actually give you the diagnosis difference between it for the lack of redness, that sort of thing. It commonly presents with your ear fullness and your hearing loss itself. The tympanic membrane has lost its transparency and there's a loss of the light reflex uh, itself, which you'll find in otitis media too. But unlike acute otitis media, bulging of the tympanic membrane is not typical. And most cases of otitis media with infusion is actually self-limiting. Uh, antibiotics, decongestants, uh, corticosteroids, they're not effective with this particular case as well. Okay, so just look out for that one. If it doesn't quite look like your typical otitis media, uh, particularly in children, it can just be fluid buildup as, as opposed to an infection or an inflammatory state. Now, if is not a primary cause. You've had a good look at the ear, you've had an examination around it, and it's not quite leading up. And you may have some other symptoms that you found on other investigations, then it's probably secondary. Okay, so you have ear pain, but there's no finding of why you've got ear pain at all. Okay, so no foreign body stuck in the ear, there's no lacerations, there's nothing wrong with the ear canal, there's nothing wrong with the tympanic membrane itself. So that becomes a secondary. 
And the best thing really to do for a secondary is to refer on. So for us, we refer on, and then other, other specialists will get involved from there. When we've done our assessment and we figured out what we're probably dealing with, we can move on to our treatment. Now, education aspect for the patient is basically bed rest when you're dealing with infection is a great idea, but keeping your ears dry is a very good idea. Okay, so no more swimming, that sort of thing. Okay, let them know if they need to come back for a hearing test um, once the symptoms have cleared up, but basically education can be kept to a minimum. If you're dealing with a parent with a child, then obviously the education can increase because the child is more likely to have a series of cases of otitis media and ear problems, probably go through a few regimes of grommets uh, before it actually gets resolves itself. And the sooner you can tell parents that, the better off they'll be. But when we're looking at treatment options as far as medication, it depends what it is. So if it's a wax impaction, then you need to basically look at ways to remove that wax. Now, if somebody has a ruptured tympanic membrane or you think they have a ruptured tympanic membrane but you can't see it because of the wax, the best thing you can do and really the only smart thing to do is to evacuate them, okay, and to refer them on to somebody else because if you can't really confirm if someone's had a tympanic membrane rupture because of wax, then really you can't do a lot of treatments. You should never use your ceramolytic agents, so your wax oil drops or your olive oil or anything like that to loosen it up. You definitely shouldn't go through your irrigation, even if you're trained. So really manual removal, with very special tools, is the only true option you have uh, to protect the tympanic membrane. So just keep that in mind. But if it's not, tympanic membrane's intact, then you can go through your options. Now, wax oil is great, even if you want to do it initially before it moves on. Uh, out-of-date sodium bicarbonate drops can really work. Olive oil is great, but then wax oil can work as well. Irrigation, if you know what you're doing. Now, if you don't know what you're doing, then leave irrigation alone. And obviously, manual removal does involve special tools. If you can see the wax sitting right at the, right at the base of the canal, sorry, right at the edge of the canal near the tragus, sure, you can get a pair of tweezers and, and pull that out. But if you need to go any deeper, it is best to refer on in order to protect the ear itself. The treatment for otitis externa really depends on whether or not it's bacterial or fungal. Now, bacterial is more common, but fungal, especially in the tropics where this thing loves to form and is more prevalent, is possible. Okay, so the signs of a bacterial otitis externa is painful on that pineal pull. Okay, and you also have a smelly, creamy discharge. And when you look into the ear, it looks like the ear canal is narrow. And because it's unilateral most of the time, you can actually compare the two to see which one's narrow, which one's not. So if it has those signs of ostitis externa, the best treatment is your otodex or your sophrodex itself. And they're just, it just drops. Now, if it's fungal, then what you'll have is you'll actually have patients complaining more of an itch instead of pain and you'll have thick debris. Now, it does look like wet newspaper that forms in clusters that sort of can fall off out of the ear canal. And compared to a bacterial, the ear canal is normal. It doesn't widen it, but it actually just makes it normal due to the lack of narrowing. And the treatment for that is your kenicomb drops is the one that you use for fungal acute otitis externa. When we move on to otitis media, your nasal decongestions and steam and that sort of thing, they can help open it up, opens up those eustachian tubes, help drainage, all that good stuff. Now, antibiotics can be used and are to be used if any of the following are present. So basically, there is no reason that you think is caused by a viral upper respiratory tract infection. You have ear discharge or an ear perforation. If you have that, straight away they get antibiotics or if the symptoms are present for three days or more, they can get antibiotics, okay? So that's the criteria. Okay, then the antibiotic of choice is amoxicillin for five days. Now this can be upgraded to include your cavalanic acid if there's no improvement after two or three days, or if your MCS from your discharge swab comes back, indicating it's a better choice. 
Every case of acute otitis media and tympanic membrane rupture needs a follow-up hearing test as well. Restrictions, play it by ear, haha, <laughs> but it needs to basically include that they're not to dive, they're not to go anywhere near water, okay, and if they need time off, then they can. If it hurts them to put on hearing protection, then you can take that into account as well. Now, referral, as we've discussed throughout, pretty much all secondary causes should be referred. Okay? Even if it's a simple dental that you know about, give it to the dentist. Okay, let them deal with what they deal with. Okay, so all secondary causes, it's best to move on. Okay, all unknown causes, so you're like, I just don't have any idea whatsoever, obviously move that on. And if you're dealing with a chronic case, so someone who's had reoccurring otitis media or a very prolonged or chronic case, then that can obviously be referred on as well. Okay, well that brings us to the end of the pearl when dealing with otalgia. As mentioned, the main goal when you're dealing with a patient consultation uh, for ear pain is to quickly distinguish whether or not it's primary or secondary, and then really basically trying to rule out if it's otitis media or something else. Okay, so primary is the most common and otitis media is the most common, but do not jump on the bandwagon that everything is that. Uh, otherwise, you'll miss some very, very key clues. And the sooner you can get on investigating secondary causes for ear pain, the better outcomes are for patients. Uh, until next time, take care.